Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar brought to you by LSVT Global. Our topic today is on atypical and advanced Parkinsonism disorders. We'll be discussing an overview and application to LSVT Big. I'll be the moderator and one of the presenters for today's webinar. My name is Laura Gousset. I'm a physical therapist, one of the LSVT Big training and certification faculty, and also chief clinical officer of LSVT Big. And I'm delighted to be joined by my colleague, also a physical therapist, Heather Cianse, um, who's also an LSVT Big training and certification faculty. Um, so these initial slides, we're just going to go over some introductions and information about the webinar before we really dig into the heart of the content today. So myself, like I said, I'm a physical therapist um, since 1997 and have been certified in LSVT Big um, for treatment of individuals with Parkinson's and other neurological disorders since 2009. And Heather and I both joined the LSVT Big faculty team in 2011 and since then have caught, taught many courses uh, for physical and occupational therapists around the globe. Um, so we're really privileged to do that and enjoy sharing our knowledge and clinical skills with other therapists and also with um, persons with Parkinson's, families and caregivers who um, could benefit as well. And Heather, would you mind just sharing uh, some brief information about you? I think our crowd today would enjoy knowing a little bit about you and your background and your current practice. Absolutely, thanks, Laura. Um, just to reiterate what Laura said, we're really excited to be with you today for this great webinar. I've been a physical therapist now since 1994, and I have the privilege of working at a center called the Dan Aaron Parkinson's Rehab Center which is at Pennsylvania Hospital in Philadelphia. And our center is primarily for individuals with Parkinson's disease, as well as the atypical Parkinsonisms. Um, I was certified in LSVT Big in 2007 and began teaching, like Laura said, in 2011. I'm also the former board member for Cure PSP and part of our interdisciplinary program in working with individuals with atypical Parkinsonism. So we're really excited to talk to you today about the atypicals as well as those who are living with the advanced stages of Parkinson's disease. Okay, thank you, Heather. And you'll hear more from Heather uh, just a bit, a bit later. So our basic disclosures, um, both Heather and I receive honorarium from LSVT Global and have a treatment preference for LSVT Big as a treatment technique. Um, if you are a physical or an occupational therapist um, attending today's webinar, we just want to give you some information. Um, first of all, if you're an LSVT Big certified physical or occupational therapist, please note that we had a professional webinar on this topic. Um, two days ago, which can be found as an on-demand webinar in your LSVT Big Clinician account. Uh, this webinar is open to anyone, but just so you know, it's not um, pre-approved for CEUs. If your state allows for self-report, simply email us at webinars at lsvtglobal.com after today's webinar, and we'd be happy to email you an electronic certificate so that you can use that for self-report, but you will have to attend for the full hour to earn a certificate. If you're not a therapist, if you're a person with Parkinson's or a person who um, cares about people with Parkinson's, we welcome you to today's webinar and um, are hopeful that the information will be informative and helpful to you. So here's the basic plan for today's webinar. Um, Heather and I will share the presentation of the webinar at the end you'll have an opportunity to ask your questions live to us. But at any time, if you wanna start typing in questions that you have related to this topic, there's a spot in your control panel that you can do that. And uh, we'll begin stockpiling those questions and at the webinar end, we'll answer as many of those questions as we can. Um, at the end of the webinar, you'll also have time to ask your questions out loud by raising your hand. I'll go over this at the end, but just so you might um, notice right now, there's a little hand icon on your control panel. Once you click that at the end of the webinar, we'll see that you have your hand raised and we'll call out your name so that you can ask your question out loud. 
You should have received an email from webinars at lsvtglobal.com with an, an attachment or a link for today's handout of the slides. If you didn't or you missed that, um, please note that there's a handout section in your control panel where you can download and print or save those handouts right now if you wish. At the end of today's webinar, there'll be a brief survey that we'll launch. Um, it should take less than five minutes, but we do appreciate when our participants fill out the survey um, because your feedback helps to inform us and improve our webinars on a continuous basis. So these are the uh, objectives for today's webinar. We're going to be defining advanced Parkinson's disease and typical features that characterize advanced Parkinson's disease. Um, Heather will also describe several atypical Parkinsonian disorders that you may or may not be familiar with. And then I'll be walking you through the application of LSVT BIG and how that protocol can be customized to meet the needs of people with advanced or atypical Parkinsonisms. So with that, I'm going to turn the microphone over to Heather to walk you through this first part. Great, thank you so much, Laura. So we first wanted to start off with a little information of what does it take to actually have a diagnosis of what we call idiopathic Parkinson's. And that means it's Parkinson's of an unknown origin. We're not quite sure what the actual cause of it is. And for someone to actually be diagnosed, they do have to have some early motor symptoms and they have to have about two out of the three. And some of them here are the bradykinesia, which is the slowness of movement tremor and rigidity. And why bradykinesia is important to talk about here is that LSVT big is really aimed at helping people to override that slowness of movement, as well as hypokinesia, which is the smallness of movement. So we're really looking to get people to make these bigger movements to overcome that slowness and smallness. Parkinson's disease does have an insidious onset, meaning it kind of starts out slow and, you know, you're not quite sure when it actually started, but you start to see some kind of nonspecific, non-motor symptoms. And that can be now in looking back for people, we know that it may be, you know, problems with your sleeping, problems with your GI system. Um, maybe perhaps you're having problems with detecting odors, so that ability to smell odors. Um, and early symptoms, most of the time people will notice that um, it is likely a tremor, but there are also people who are not tremor dominant and begin with um, maybe a lack of arm swing or they feel like their foot is actually catching on the ground. Parkinson's is always asymmetrical, meaning that it always starts on one side of the body and then progresses to both sides of the body as the disease process goes on. Um, the indication for the medication, so the DA means dopamine replacement, so um, patients with Parkinson's disease, the, the vast majority respond well to the dopamine replacement therapy known as levodopa, carbidopa, or also Cinemet. And it really is a differential diagnosis. At this point, it is made uh, mostly by movement disorder neurologist or general neurologist. There are some clinics that do have the ability to do uh, specialized brain scans that help to show uh, the amount of dopamine uptake in the brain, but the majority of people are diagnosed simply by um, the symptoms that they have and ruling out that it's nothing else. Next slide. So when we're talking about advanced Parkinson's disease, what, are, what do we mean by that? Do we mean that it's somebody who's had Parkinson's for a really long time? Um, is it somebody who has more disability? Let's kind of break down what we're talking about for people who are early in the disease progress kind of going into the moderate stages where a lot of people start to seek out therapy in that stage. And unfortunately, um, you know, we find that people are waiting too long. We really want to get to these folks earlier. And then we also find on the other end of the spectrum, people who have more advanced Parkinson's um, aren't going to therapy enough. And they're thinking there might not be anything that's out there for them to do because they're having so many complications. So let's look at the next slide and we'll talk about what we mean um, when we're talking about that advanced disease. What we're showing here is the modified Honan-Yar scale, and this takes people through the stages of Parkinson's. So as I said before, it starts on one side of the body, progresses to the other side of the body, leads to problems um, with balance and walking. And then when people get into those more advanced stages, we're talking about stages four and five, we're talking about people who are still have the ability to walk or to be able to stand unassisted, but the disability is pretty great in that they probably need someone with them most of the time, and they're gonna need much more help with their activities of daily living. 
until we get to that stage five. And those are people who really, at this point, can't walk. They are essentially bedridden um, or need to be using a wheelchair unless they have someone um, who's really able to help them. And even in those cases, it's probably very limited mobility. Next slide. So the additional features when we're talking about people who are living with advanced Parkinson's disease um, is that there are many more motor complications. And that means that symptoms do get worse. So there is more tremor, there is more slowness, there is more stiffness, there are um, a greater amount of falls, there are more speech language difficulties, problems with swallowing. And this is despite the fact that we have aggressive pharmacological and behavioral managements because the medications can only do so much and only last so long. So some of those motor complications are um, what are known as on-off fluctuations, meaning when someone takes their Cinemet, um, their levodopa carbidopa, they feel like they're moving probably the best they can move. But when it's right before that next dose, they might have something called wearing off where they're not starting to feel um, as good or as robust as they once did. And then they kind of go off, meaning that it almost feels like the medication isn't working. And for some people, this can be a very high and low dip or for some people much more gradual. There's also a complication known as dyskinesias. These are a side effect of long-term use of Cinemet. And the longer someone has Parkinson's disease and the longer they're taking uh, their Cinemet, that carbidopa, levodopa, um, and the more they have to take, the more likely they are to have these movements. And I always teach people to kind of think about Michael J. Fox. Um, he has those extra movements that you notice. Those are what dyskinesias are. They're, they're involuntary, uncontrolled movements. And less responsiveness to the drugs. So the drugs tend to not give as much um, bang anymore. They are less powerful over time and people aren't getting as good a relief of their symptoms over time with the advancing symptoms. Next slide. So the motor characteristics when we're talking about movement with people who have advanced Parkinson's disease. I mentioned before that that bradykinesia and that hypokinesia, that slowness of movement and that smallness of movement, they become very, very high in this population. People tend to have much more rigidity, so they feel much tighter. They feel um, less flexible in what they're able to do. And then unfortunately, there's much more freezing in this stage of the disease, whereas people have difficulty initiating movement. And that may be difficulty with standing up from a chair, being able to take that first step. It may be with bringing a hand um, up to the mouth when eating. Freezing can take place in many different motor fashions. Um, the difficulty with walking becomes so that most people at this stage are starting or really do actually need a device or need someone there with them. Um, and this is because of just that slowness and smallness of the movement of the feet, as well as an increased fear of falling. Um, there may also be problems with, like I said, that severe freezing of gait. Most of these folks are not able to live alone, unfortunately, and they really do need help with most things that are happening. Um, if left alone, the um, amount of falls can really increase. And I mentioned those assistive devices for gait, but also people are needing more assistive devices for other things like having a tub bench that they're gonna need to sit in, or maybe they need hand bars next to the toilet. And unfortunately, there is a progression of the posture more into that flexed or bent over position, um, as well as people get more flexion in the knees, they get more flexion in the hands, and it, it seems like everything is pulling down and in. Next slide. So then we also have the non-motor characteristics of people who are living with advanced Parkinson's. And you're gonna see more neuropsychological changes. So people are having more difficulty with being able to process new information. They have the ability to focus on tasks, the ability to um, learn new information and then kind of learn from it and then be able to get that information back out to you. Um, people often at these later stages do end up with a degree of dementia, so there are memory changes. Uh, people do have problems with psychoses and hallucinations. Depression, anxiety, and apathy also tend to worsen in that. Um, apathy can be very disabling in folks because they really um, feel as though there's nothing there to motivate them and they really aren't enjoying what they're doing anymore. Sleep disorders become much more problematic where people are having um, problems with falling asleep, with staying asleep, perhaps sleeping too much in the daytime and then being up at night, as well as the autonomic dysfunction. So people who are having difficulty with bowel and bladder, feeling like they have to go very frequently or they have the urge to go and they have to go very quick. 
There are problems much more with constipation. And then if you think about all of the difficulty with the tightness and the number of falls, and even with constipation, that can lead to a lot of issues with pain. So all those things kind of together make it much more challenging to um, live with this disease process. But Laura and I are here today to tell you that we do have options out there. And hopefully, um, the more you learn about LSVT Big, you'll see that this is an option to help improve the quality of life for these folks. Next slide. So I said this before, but these motor and non-motor complications really dramatically impair quality of life, not only for the person living with Parkinson's disease, but also for their, their care partners and their family members and the home health aides who are with them. Um, it can be very difficult to communicate and to um, effectively manage this. But luckily we do have LSVT Big that can make um, these situations easier to handle and really streamline the way that we communicate as well as move with individuals. Next slide. So there are also secondary um, impairments that can happen with people. So if you are someone who is living with advanced Parkinson's disease and you're not moving as much, you're going to become weaker. So there is loss of muscle, mu muscular strength. People get weaker, they feel tighter. Um, so if you're constantly in a seated position, then that means your knees are always in that bent position. And when you go to stand up, it's harder to straighten them. Um, if you're moving less, then you're going to be cardiovascular deconditioned, meaning you're not getting enough aerobic exercise. Keep that good blood flowing to the brain and to the muscles. We mentioned the pain before, but also that loss of range of normal motion. So the ability to open the hands up very big to be able to reach for something, the ability to lift the shoulder high enough to be able to put an arm into a jacket. And then you put those things together with that increased inability to really maintain one's balance. So um, not only just the falls with the walking, but people can have impairments with just being able to stand tall to be able to put a jacket on and may lose their balance. And unfortunately, one of the last ones here is aspiration, where people have um, you know, a harder time um, with the voice and the swallowing and the quote unquote, it went down the wrong pipes. Um, so instead of that food going down the esophagus, it goes into the trachea, and then that leads to that choking sensation. And for some people, um, that can lead to actually having pneumonia. Next slide. So we talked a little bit about the symptoms of advanced Parkinson's disease, but what is atypical Parkinsonism, and how does that really differ from our folks who have idiopathic Parkinson's? Well, a lot of times people with the atypical Parkinsonisms have one or more of those key features like Parkinson's. So they can start out having problems with posture, they can have trouble with tremors, they can have slowness, they can have problems with balance. Um, unfortunately though, the difference with this is that it is a different underlying pathology, meaning that it's a different part of what's going on in the brain. So it's not just a dopamine deficiency with our folks with the atypicals, it's something else, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And it can really be difficult in the beginning for people to get a correct diagnosis because, again, it starts out looking like Parkinson's disease, um, but unfortunately, over time, it does morph into these other conditions. And these other atypical conditions do have numerous symptoms that are not seen in folks with Parkinson's disease. And that's why, in fact, the term used to be known as Parkinson's plus, because people look like they had Parkinson's plus additional symptoms. And one of the things um, that is very hard for people living with the atypical Parkinsonisms is that they often don't respond well or respond in the same way to those anti-Parkinsonism medications. So a lot of folks do have some relief initially with Cinemet or the carbidopa levodopa, but over the long term, there really are no good medications specifically for the atypicals. Next slide. So we're going to take some time and talk about the most common type of atypical Parkinsonisms that are out there, and we'll break them down. Um, I just worked with a, a lovely woman today who was diagnosed with CBD, and she said to me, boy, this sounds like alphabet soup. And I said, you're absolutely right. These, these names of these diseases are very, very long, and that's why we use these acronyms for them. So for the first one is the most common one. That's progressive supranuclear palsy. That's PSP. Then we have multiple system atrophy, MSA cortico-basilar degeneration, which is CBD, and then finally, Lewy body dementia, which is LBD, and frontotemporal degeneration, which is FTD. So let's take a look at some of the next slides, and we'll break each of those down and give you a little bit more information on those. 
So I think it's important to know, you know, what are the causes of these atypical Parkinsonisms? I mentioned that it's not due to a lack of the dopamine of that neurotransmitter like folks with Parkinson's disease. Um, these diseases are what are called tau apathies or alpha synucleopathies. And the first one there, alpha synuclein, that is the primary structural component of Lewy bodies. And Lewy bodies are proteins within the brain. And in people with Parkinson's disease, there's more of these Lewy bodies and there's sort of abnormal clumps of protein that really shouldn't be um, so predominant in the brain. So folks with Parkinson's disease do have um, this problem with alpha synuclein, but that does not mean that all people with Parkinson's do develop Lewy body dementia, nor does it mean that everyone with Lewy body dementia has Parkinson's. So we see this problem with the alpha synuclein in Parkinson's disease, multiple system atrophy, and Lewy body dementia. Now the other atypical Parkinsonisms are due to a protein called tau. And tau is a protein that really helps to kind of support and stabilize um, the healthy growth and condition of what we kind of call the skeleton of brain cells in the central nervous system, meaning that they keep them healthy, they make them do what they're supposed to do, and everything works well. Well, unfortunately, when something goes wrong with tau and there's a defect in it, they start to accumulate too much of them and they produce these things called neurofibrillary tangles. You've probably heard about neurofibrillary tangles from Alzheimer's disease. We've known about that for some time, but we now do know that tau also is that problem with progressive supranuclear palsy, cortical basilar degeneration, as well as frontotemporal dementia. Next slide. So the incidence and prevalence of these diseases, you know, there are a lot of therapists out there who will work a very long career and may only meet one or two people with the atypicals because they are quite rare. I mentioned before that they are frequently misdiagnosed as Parkinson's. And you can see that the rates vary from one to six per 100,000, except for those with Lewy body dementia. That is higher at 400 per 100,000. Unfortunately, the life expectancy rate of individuals living with the atypical Parkinsonisms is much shorter than someone with regular or idiopathic Parkinson's, and that's due to the severity and all those symptoms, the problems with aspiration, the problems with the increased number of falls, with the cognitive changes, and all of the motor changes. Uh, most folks do end up in the hospital generally from infections like a urinary tract infection, uh, some type of a, of a pneumonia or an aspiration pneumonia, or a serious fall that can end up in a fracture or some kind of head trauma. Next slide. So when we're looking at someone who may look like they have Parkinson's disease in the beginning, but things don't look exactly like Parkinson's disease, there's a way that we can use to help us differentiate between Parkinson's and progressive supranuclear palsy, and that acronym is FIGS. Folks with PSP, unlike people with Parkinson's, have very frequent sudden falls early on in the course of the disease. Folks with Parkinson's disease tend to not have their falls until the mid or later stages. Now, the other thing is with PSP is that these falls tend to be backward, where a lot of our folks with Parkinson's disease, the falls are forward. I mentioned before that the medications are not particularly as helpful. The other hallmark of PSP is something called gaze palsy, and that's where people lose the ability to track the eyes up and down. It always, or I don't want to say always, it generally starts with people's ability to look downward. They lose that ability, and you can think, you know, if you couldn't look down, you couldn't see a curb or a step or something in your way on the floor. Um, it does eventually um, progress on to the inability to look up, and with some people, the ability to look side to side. And then the last one for there, the S, is the speech and swallowing changes that can be very problematic in that. Let's take a look at our next slide. The other symptoms of PSP, and we're spending more time on this because it's the most, com the most common one, is there are emotional and personality changes because the part of the brain, the frontal lobe, um, has some dysfunction. Things are not working there. So people's emotions um, can be very labile. They can be crying at the wrong time, laughing at the wrong time, and, and seem like a different person. We mentioned the apathy before. And the next one is the rocket sign. And that is where a lot of people with PSP tend to be hyperkinetic, meaning they move too quickly. Um, in order for us to get up out of a chair, there's a lot of things that have to happen. We need to bend forward, we need to push out, we need to push up. And unfortunately, folks with PSP with the rocket sign tend to move way too fast 
and kind of just rock it up out of the chair and they actually end up falling backwards into the chair. And I've had um, a number of patients who have actually tipped chairs over um, and fallen back in the chair or if it's a chair up against the wall have hit their heads against the wall. Bradyphrenia becomes much more predominant in this disease, so that's the slowness of thought. And then not just the gaze palsy, but there are a kind of a whole multitude of eye disturbances, things such as double vision or blepharospasms where the eyes actually close. It's an involuntary closing of the eyes. Um, not enough blinking. Difficulty making eye contact, so sometimes it can look like they're not interested or they're not paying attention. And then issues with something called square wave jerks. And that means that it's much more difficult for folks with PSP to focus their eyes on a target. So you can imagine how difficult that would be for watching TV, for reading, for eating, and all sorts of things that we really need to focus our eyesight onto. Next slide. Our next one is MSA or multiple system atrophy. And MSA used to just be called shy Dreger syndrome, but we now know that MSA really kind of comes in three categories. The first one is MSAP, and that's the one that most likely looks like Parkinson's. So that's a Parkinsonian. Um, these patients do have slowness and stiffness, but they do have some degree of a cerebellar dysfunction. And your cerebellum is the part of your brain that helps with balance. So these people can have some, some issues with balance there as well. The second classification is autonomic, and this is what I said before, uh, known as the shy Dreger syndrome. This is people who really have difficulty with orthostatic hypotension, meaning that when they go from sitting to standing or lying to sitting or they make too quick of a movement, their blood pressure drops really quickly and it makes them feel like they're going to um, pass out, and in some cases they actually do. More difficulty with constipation, urinary incontinence, and um, frequency. And then the last category is the MSAC, which is cerebellar. And that means it involves more of that cerebe cerebellar um, region of the brain, and that really impacts the balance for people. So they're much more ataxic, more uncontrolled with their movements, uh, much less balanced, and that also can impair the speech as well. Um, a difficulty with MSA in all three is that it also is common with this fronto um, executive dysfunction, meaning that people have problems, again, with the ability to, um, you know, stay focused, with their ability to kind of have safe judgment um, and some personality changes, as well as having problems with memory and visual spatial. So being able to see changes in floor patterns, being able to see a step, um, being able to see how far away something is or how close it is. Next slide. The next one is CBD, cortical basilar degeneration, and that term we use is chow. Um, with these folks um, with CBD, there are cognitive changes. Um, can be very mild early on, but in some folks can progress to a full dementia. I mentioned the ineffective medications before, um, but the kind of feature to point out with CBD is it really has an asymmetrical presentation, meaning that it kind of starts more on one side of the body than the other. And people have um, what we call apraxia, meaning they can't figure out how to kind of use the arm. So I'm not, you know, I'm reaching for the glass, but my hand doesn't actually reach for the glass and I, I can't coordinate it to do what I need it to do. And I'm not sure how to turn the key anymore. But then they also suffer from a condition called alien limb phenomenon. And this is where an arm or a leg can sort of not feel like it's their own body part anymore. And it sort of does odd movements on its own that they're not voluntarily doing. They may be doing something with one arm and the other arm is doing something different. And then the last one, there's a lot of these odd movements or feelings where people will complain about, you know, I feel stiff, I feel slow, I feel kind of clumsy, I just, I feel odd, I have these different sensations. Um, so you can see how some of these things are like Parkinson's, but they have um, eventually a lot of things that are much more different from idiopathic Parkinson's. Next slide. And now we're going to kind of shift and talk about the dementias a little bit here with Lewy body dementia. Um, and this is an, an unfortunate condition where there really is a progressive cognitive decline. And usually it happens about one year after people have started to see symptoms of Parkinsonism. So changes in their walking, slowness, stiffness, those things. Um, but in order for that diagnosis, there really does need to be two of these core features, um, one of which is fluctuating cognition, meaning that you know, within a day, someone can be very lucid and very coherent and, and, and moving around and thinking very well. And at the end of the day, that could completely change and that person's having a lot of difficulty. That could be day to day, it could be hour to hour. 
The other core feature is the visual hallucinations where people are seeing things that aren't there, typically people or animals, small children. Um, and I mentioned the Parkinsonism. Unfortunately, with Lewy body dementia, there is um, often a very rapid progression of postural changes. And then that's generally um, in a flex or a forward position, um, and sometimes in a side-to-side -side pattern or a lateral flexion. So very important in this population of folks to get them working on that posture right away. Next slide. And our last one here is FTD or frontotemporal degeneration. Um, and really what we're seeing the hallmark of frontotemporal degeneration is patients have a gradual progressive decline in their behavior or their language. Um, memory is usually pretty good, but people's personalities take a very great change where people um, may be more um, apt to say things they never said before or to be more aggressive or to be more sexually uninhibited. Um, it comes in very many different forms, but the, the change in the behavior, but also that ability with the language. So it becomes more difficult for people um, to communicate. And unfortunately, as that disease does progress, it does become more difficult for people to kind of stay on top of things. So they have difficulty with planning and organizing activities, um, that inappropriate behavior um, in work or social settings, more difficulty caring for themselves. And in because of all of that, people are really going to need much more help. And this does tend to occur a little bit more in the younger population than the onset of Parkinson's with people more in their 50s and 60s. Next slide. So general points to remember if you are working with individuals with atypical Parkinsonisms is that it really is not treated well like Parkinson's diseases with medications and there is no surgical treatment. The symptoms and presentations can vary greatly, meaning that sometimes people can look like they have a little bit of all of the atypicals. And we really do need to think about compensatory strategies they may need to be started earlier, meaning that we need to use adaptive devices. They may need more help from caregivers or loved ones. Whereas we're thinking more restorative with our folks with Parkinson's disease where we can actually improve something and maybe slow it down, we may not have that possibility in the atypicals. Next slide. So we have to remember though that we can still have a wonderful impact on the lives of our people with atypical Parkinson's, um, as well as our folks with advanced PD. And you know, what are we thinking about? What are we trying to do? We wanna maintain or even slightly improve some of their physical capabilities or their capacities. So being able to have them communicate to the best of their ability with vocal loudness and quality, their pitch range, how intelligible is their speech? Um, can we help them with the stiffness and the tightness? Can we help them to be able to have better posture to stand taller so that they're able to have better balance? So if we can get those small movements and those slow movements to be bigger and faster, then we have some degree of ability to improve that. So we want to maintain things. So we want to keep people being able to move as safely as possible. And that doesn't mean that we're saying we're getting rid of all devices. They're going to go from a wheelchair to using a cane. It means that whatever is the safest way that they're moving, we're gonna help them to maintain that, as well as that ability when we're working with our speech language pathologist with LSVT loud with swallowing. And uh, functional communication and movement, we really wanna use that to improve and maintain the function, enhance their safety. And again, most importantly, I think with people who um, are living with family members who are not institutionalized, you know, they still wanna be able to have a relationship. They don't wanna be um, seen as their partner being their full-time nurse. Um, we wanna decrease that amount of caregiver burden. So if we're able to help someone to move better by teaching that care partner how to cue them or how to model the movement, then we're decreasing that burden on them. And that's where we really use the whole care team to do external cueing. So that means that we're giving them more reminders and maybe we're touching them, we're shaping them, we're helping to kind of help them start the movement, but not fully doing the movement for them. So we really do um, still have the ability to improve that quality of life, not only for the person living with the disease, also that care partner. Next slide. But it really does take that multidisciplinary or even an interdisciplinary team um, because it, like we said before, especially with the atypicals, the um, medical management or the pharmacological management isn't there. So we need um, behavioral treatments that speech pathologists, physical therapists, and occupational therapists can provide. Um, but the best case scenario would be able to have 
you know, a neuropsychologist, social workers, nutritionists who can work with people to make sure that they maintain their weight, as well as that solid medical team, knowing that, you know, it may not just be the neurologist, but it may be that nurse who's able to see that patient more. Um, is it the pharmacist as well who's making recommendations to, you know, maybe you should take your medication at this time of the day with this meal, or maybe you should avoid that. We really do need to make sure that people in the advanced stages and people with the atypicals are really, really well supported. They often feel kind of thrown to the side and feel left out, like there's not much left. So it's very important to help them feel empowered. Um, and again, like I said before, behavioral intervention really is the most effective therapy. So it is the therapies, PT, OT, and speech, that are really going to be the most effective for improving the communication and the function of these patients. All right, thank you, Heather. That was a great uh, overview of advanced PD and the atypical Parkinsonisms as well. And like you mentioned before, um, it can be, I think, daunting to look at the list of symptoms and complexity of these diagnoses, um, but that there's hope that that you know you and I as physical therapists have seen this with our patients time and time again. That you know even when a person has advanced PD or one of the atypicals there's still a lot that we can do through a treatment intervention um, that's evidence-based like LSVT big. And uh, so if you're not familiar with LSVT big, it's an evidence-based physical and occupational therapy protocol that was initially developed for, for people with idiopathic Parkinson's disease. But over the last uh, 10 plus years, we've used it on um, many, many people with other diagnoses, including the atypical Parkinsonisms. And the framework is built in a way that it can be, it's flexible enough to really adapt to the needs of a range of individuals and different diagnoses. And so the, in these coming slides, I'm going to walk you through um, the LSVT protocol and how we might make some of those adaptations that might be necessary in these instances. So the LSVT protocol snapshot looks like this. Um, this is not a general exercise pro approach that you might find in the community, such as dancing or boxing or yoga or anything like that. This is actually a physical and occupational therapy intervention that's delivered by um, therapists who've taken an advanced training and certification course to obtain the certification. So it's a one-on-one -on -one interve intervention. So you won't be seen in a group, um, it's an individual one. The time of practice is as listed here. It's a one month treatment program. You'd be six, seeing 16 sessions over that one month and the dosage is four consecutive days a week for four weeks. The sessions are hour long sessions. And so it is an intensive treatment, um, but that intensity is really um, one of the key factors for generating success, not only during that month of treatment, but to achieve lasting gains following treatment as well. Um, the person that's receiving LSVT big also has homework exercises and what are called carryover assignments all 30 days of the month to really get them into the habit of exercising and moving better so that when they're discharged from the one month LSVT big protocol, they're really um, set up and ready to continue exercising on their own and are already in that habit. So this is what a one hour treatment session looks like. On the left side, you'll see maximal daily exercises and seven exercises listed under those. I'll show you some examples of those in just a couple of minutes, uh, but briefly, they're large movements that are performed in all directions, so forward, backward, sideways, and rotational movements involving the whole body from um, your toes all the way up to your fingertips. On the right side, you'll see something called functional component tasks, hierarchy exercises, and big walking. And these are activities that are very much personalized to each individual working on functional tasks that are meaningful to them. Um, and those will vary from person to person. So we'll get into that in just a minute as well. But in general, you can think of the maximal daily exercises as your building block. So they'll help you to learn how to move bigger and better in all planes so that you can then use that bigger and better movement in, um, in function. 
on the second half, you can think of those other things as that translation to function, practicing your larger amplitude movements in meaningful tasks. So the LSVT big exercises themselves help in many different ways. Um, there are distinct start and stops in all of the movements. So they're not necessarily fluid movements. They have key um, start and end points. And for people with Parkinson's disease and atypical Parkinsonisms, that's really important to learn how to do because there can be problems with freezing and festination when your feet get going too fast and have difficulty stopping the movement when you want to stop changing directions and so on. Um, they also really help to build up endurance and stamina. And as Heather mentioned before, secondary um, complications can include decreased endurance. Um, people with Parkinson's disease and other neurological disorders um, by nature tend to become less active as their mobility declines. And so this is one way um, to improve that endurance needed for function and needed for a healthy cardiovascular system as well. Um, they're challenging from a balance perspective, and so balance tends to improve even in conditions where balance can be affected. Strength and range of motion improve. There's a lot of built-in repetitions and um, large amplitude movements that really help to stretch the body in all planes, especially the what we call the anterior muscles of the body, like the hip flexors and the shoulder muscles that tend to get very tight from um, being in a flexed posture or spending a large amount of time in sitting. And lastly, all of these um, things contribute to improve safety with movement. And so when your posture is better, you're stronger, your balance is better, um, naturally your uh, movement will be safer and your risk of falling should be less as well. This is just a picture of all seven of the maximal daily exercises that are done in the standard format. So you can see the model Jenny here does two of them in a seated position where she's really holding that position for a nice big stretch in those muscle groups for a sustained amount of time. The rest of the pictures you see Jenny is standing, uh, but I want to let you know in the next few slides how these can be adapted for people that need to hang on or don't have um, ability to stand anymore. So one of the simplest things that can be done is to start with, for someone that has mild balance problems, is simply hanging onto a chair or a stable surface on one or both sides. In the next video I'll play, I'm going to show Jenny doing one of the standard exercises, the step to the side. And so just give me one minute here and I'll share this video with you. The next exercise is the step to the side and reach. You're going to step to the side big with big arms and then come back and finish big. All right, so you hopefully were able to see um, that video of Jenny doing the step to the side exercise. So can these exercises be adapted? Yes, we can adapt one or multiple exercises or even all of the exercises as needed for each particular individual's um, situation. So here's um, some snapshots of those exact same exercises, but done in the seated position. So you can see instead of stepping forward and standing, Jenny is stepping, for, or she's stepping forward in the sitting position. Um, the second, the middle picture, you'll see her stepping out to the side in the seated position, um, just like the previous video that you watched when you saw her stepping to the side in a standing position. So in this next video, I'll show you some examples of these adaptations. So just give me one minute here to share this video. Okay, we're gonna do a big step, big reach. 
Good, big posture. Nice, and back big. Good, big step. Good, back big. Big step. Good, big hands, big arms. Beautiful, and back big. Big step, and back big. Okay, so I won't show all of that video, but I think it gives you an example of what that might look like when um, she's doing those exercises with Bob in a seated position. And then lastly, the video, the, all of the exercises can be adapted to a supine position. So if there's a person that really isn't safe in standing or has, or excuse me, in sitting or has a very limited tolerance for sitting, we can adapt any of them to uh, supine. This is also really helpful for people that um, function in bed for most of the day. For example, maybe they get dressed in bed, um, spend a lot of time in bed uh, because there's functional applications to these movements that will help with bed mobility, um, turning in bed, dressing in bed, etc. So in the next uh, video, I'll show you an example of some of these. And if the audio is not coming through, don't worry, it's not crucial. It's just to give you an example of what those movements look like in that position. All right, Bob, we're gonna do your floor to ceiling exercise. Okay? All right. I want you to bend your knees up with big effort and put your feet on the bed big. Good. Okay, the first movement is a big reach up towards the ceiling. Big hands. Good, right here, big hands, big fingers. Good. Now you're gonna reach down big towards your legs. Good, and up big all the way overhead, as far as you can reach, as far as you can reach. Good, and then we're gonna go out big, out to the sides, big hands. You can even drop them down a little bit, bring them out there, keep them off the bed and feel that work. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and then finish big. Good job. Thank you. Okay. Hey? Feels good. Good. We're gonna go through it one. Okay, so same thing there. I'm not going to play all of the video, but um, I think one of the themes that you could probably notice is that whether uh, the video was showing the person doing the exercise in standing or in sitting or in supine, they're all big, very deliberate movements that help um, with normal movement in everyday life. So what are some other common adaptations used in LSVT Big? Well, we already talked for uh, about balance challenges, so using as much support as needed in standing or in sitting or in supine to make the exercises safe for each individual. When we're using mobility, um, when we're working on mobility, we can use assistive devices, and so if that person requires a walker or a rollator or a wheelchair or um, a raised seat or um, a lift chair, for example, we can practice with those devices without any problem. Early caregiver training is really, really important when an individual has advanced Parkinson's disease or a fairly rapidly progressive condition such as one of the atypical Parkinsonisms. And so we really advocate for um, early caregiver training while the person um, with, with the condition is still moving relatively well. Um, in that time of, you know, the disease process, those are overall less stress and specifically talking about the atypical Parkinsonisms. And so learning becomes easier because there's no time pressure um, for that. And so in, really in all cases, we would recommend that the patient start to identify a team of people who might be helping them at home with mobility or with their home exercise program 
um, as needed if the disease worsens or when the disease worsens. And for the advanced Parkinson's disease, we always recommend caregiver training not only for physical challenges, but sometimes for common cognitive challenges as well. Um, if needed, we can reduce the repetitions and intensity to make that exercise safe and feasible for each person. And of course, we always take precautions to limit things such as um, orthostatic hypo hypotension or other underlying medical issues that that person might be um, having. So there are, like Heather said, cognitive and non-motor challenges that are common to many of these disorders. And in LSVT Big, we have a very redundant and simple cue of whatever you do, let's do it bigger. So we say think big and with bigger effort. And this really facilitates motor learning and retention because the person um, with the condition doesn't have to learn a complex set of instructions or a different set of instructions for different activities. It's just this notion of whatever I do, I'm going to do it bigger. And um, we find that even people with dementia are able to learn what this cue of big means and respond to it effectively. The intensity of dosage at 16 visits is really necessary in producing meaningful and long-lasting changes. And oftentimes because of some of the learning challenges that become apparent in these conditions or stages, um, the person might need even a few more than 16 sessions, but we would say um, never less than that. And we already talked about early caregiver training is really essential um, to not only coach the exercises at home, but learn how to carry over it to function at home and how to cue the person for best function at home as well. So our goal is really all about function. And function, um, even if it has to be cued, really does reduce caregiver burden because now the person might be able to get out of a chair simply with a cue of using their bigger movements versus needing physical assistance to be lifted out of the chair. And so that improves the quality of life for both of them, both the person with PD and the caregiver when safety and independence is improved. But the daily exercises are vital. So um, even with these conditions, we expect significant gains and progress over the month. Um, but that only comes um, when a team, the patient and their care team is really dedicated to doing the exercises every day and also following therapy as well. So functional task specific training is one of the differentiators of LSVT big in comparison to some general exercise approaches where only exercises are practiced. So we do practice large amplitude movements, but we um, really feel and believe that it's important to practice the actual tasks which are challenging for the patient. So for many people, it might be like Bob, difficulty getting out of a low or soft chair. For some individuals, it's related to toileting or bathing or dressing, or even simple things like turning over in bed, positioning in bed, or getting in and out of bed. And so a therapist um, with LSVT Big will really dig in and identify what are the functional tasks that are difficult um, that you want to improve on to help you stay in your home, improve your safety, improve your independence and quality of life. So here's some examples. Um, you know, it could be recreational things like gardening. It could be simple things like getting out of a car or getting socks on or buttoning my own buttons. But those are all built in to the LSVT Big Protocol. And then with every session, we're also working on mobility training. Um, if a person can walk, even a few steps, we'll be working on walking with whatever assistive device that they need. And if a person can't walk, we'll work on wheelchair mobility training um, so that they can use their feet or hands to propel the wheelchair as independently and as effectively as possible. If a person has issues with freezing, where their feet are sticking, um, where they're having falls, we really use the LSVT Big Protocol to address those issues as well. With that, we also train caregivers how to help um, proactively prevent freezing episodes and also um, how they learn how to help a person with PD to get out of a freeze if they do have freezing. That can be a very um, scary and frustrating situation. 
So during the one month of treatment, um, the individual will get something called daily carryover assignments. And these are assignments that we mandate to use their bigger and better movements in real world situations outside of therapy. So we might say, you know what, today you said you're going to see your son. He was going to come over and see you. When you see him, I want you to give him like a much bigger hug than you normally give him and really or really open the door to welcome him in. Um, and the idea is, is to get used to using those bigger movements around other people and to gain comfort with that. We also advocate daily exercise practice. And a lot of people find that the homework helper videos are, hel are really helpful in motivating and doing those at home. Um, volume one is the standard exercises and volume two, they're adapted to sitting and supine positions. Plus we have a chapter for caregivers. After LSVT Big, um, not only can you exercise on your own, but we do have new group options called Loud for Life or Big for Life for people that have gone through the protocols. And you should really go back to see your therapist on average every three to six months. If it's a more progressive condition like an atypical Parkinsonism, it's usually a bit sooner, like every three months for a tune-up, um, just to make sure that you're maintaining your function um, and maintaining participation with uh, your daily activities and also your daily exercises as well. So we leave you with this. There is hope and there's a great deal of hope um, even if you are faced with an atypical Parkinsonism or advanced Parkinson's disease. And therapy can really truly help you to improve your function, um, keep you functioning in things that you enjoy, keep you at home longer, keep you safer and keep you participating in life. Um, and so it's important to really um, take the time and invest and learn more um, about these options that you have. Here's a quote from someone that um, sent this to us. He had gone through LSVT Big and he said, here are some activities that I had avoided, which are now part of my routine again, getting up from a low couch, getting into and out of my car, which is low to the ground, putting bills into my wallet, Retrieving my cell phone from pants pocket, putting it back, and properly donning a sports jacket and buttoning a shirt all in four weeks. And so, you know, I think if a person doesn't have Parkinsonism, those things seem really simple. Um, but when you are faced with a condition like this, you know how valuable it is to be able to do even those simple things in life. And so that is the hope um, and even more that, that you can have as well. So in summary, um, you've learned that how LSVT Big is applicable to all stages of Parkinson's disease and can be customized to each patient, um, how it can increase speed, um, independence, and safety with mobility, and how it can restore, improve, and maintain function. And yes, there are unique challenges with these conditions, but um, with creative solutions and increased caregiver involvement and the right therapy team and the right medical team, there is great potential for improved and maintained function. So we have a few minutes to take your questions. Um, here's some instructions on how to ask questions. You can ask your question by typing it in the control panel. You can raise your hand or you can email us at info at lsvtglobal.com. And if we run out of time, you can always email us at that. If you have to jump off because it's close to the top of the hour, um, we thank you for joining us and hope that you join us for the upcoming webinars. And these last few slides on your handout, just so you show you some organizations where you can learn more about Parkinson's disease and the atypical Parkinsonisms as well, as well as find LSVT certified clinicians. This just shows some resources that we offer on our website and information on our next webinar, um, which will be next month on application of LSVT Loud, the speech treatment to these diagnoses of advanced and atypical Parkinsonisms. So I do believe that we have one question um, for Heather. Um, she says, are neuropsychological changes correlated to a de decrease of dopamine or other structures? Wow, that's a great question. Um, and the answer is it likely has to do with both. 
Um, it isn't just one part of the brain that's impacted by that loss of dopamine. Um, there are other physiological um, and biological changes that are actually happening in the brains of folks um, with Parkinson's disease. So the answer is it's, it's both. Okay, thank you, Heather. And uh, I'm no expert, but I believe that there's also other neurotransmitters besides dopamine that are involved as well. Um, Heather, I did have one quick question for you related to frontal temporal degeneration. Um, what are the motor signs that you would typically see with that type of diagnosis? Uh, with the FTD, with patients with FTD? So, you know, they can be widely variable. Um, but most of the motor symptoms that we see are people having impulsivity, so they actually move too quickly. Um, they're not actually breaking down their movements um, into safe movements. So using something like LSVT Big can help them, you know, not necessarily to make these larger amplitude movements, but to make more controlled definitive movements. So a nice way of teaching people to break down how to do a sit to stand, how to walk with more control. Um, and again, that can vary patient to patient, mm -hmm. uh, but that is typically one of the motor symptoms that we do see. Got it. Thank you. And right now, I don't see any other questions coming in. Um, and we are at the top of the hour. And so just as a reminder, if you do think of questions, you can email us at info at lsvtglobal.com or webinars at lsvtglobal.com. We'll get either one. Um, or you can even ask your question on your survey. That should pop up at the end. Uh, we hope to see you next month. And if you'd like to view this webinar again or share it with someone, it will be recorded and available as an on-demand webinar within two days. You can find all of our on-demand webinars and upcoming live webinars on our blog, and our blog can be accessed through our website, lsvtglobal.com. So thank you again for joining us. Um, we hope that you all have a fabulous rest of your day, and see you next time.